Hands on Boulevard time. Welcome to the Boulevard Collector Series. Today, I'm pleased to introduce you all to Jason Heaton. He has a decade-long history of adventure, travel, wristwatch, and gear writing, and his work has appeared in Outside, Gear Patrol, Men's Journal, Wired, Australian Geogra Geographic, and Houdinki. The New York Times once called him a test pilot for the world's most illustrious undersea timepieces. He's also the co-host of the popular podcast, The Gray NATO. A certified technical diver, Heaton has been underwater all over the world, from the Galapagos to New Zealand to the Caribbean. And since 2015, he has been a member of the prestigious Explorers Club. He lives with his wife, Jishani, and their two cats in Minneapolis, where he recently completed his first novel, Depth Charge. Welcome to the show, Jason Heaton. Thanks so much, Michael. I'm, I'm really uh, pleased to be here. This is going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I really appreciate your time uh, and, and uh, speaking to our uh, Boulevard Collectors community on YouTube. So beyond the, uh, the really interesting bio, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, the, the bio only goes so far, but, you know, my, my background is, uh, is in writing. I've been, uh, I was an English lit major back in college. Uh, I went to the University of Minnesota, and uh, I'm from the Midwest. I was born near Chicago and grew up in Milwaukee and then moved up here to Minneapolis for school. And um, my, I kind of got my start professionally in writing when I was uh, doing some technical writing uh, for packaging machinery and various other manuals. And then um, kind of on the side, just started doing freelance work, uh, reviewing outdoor gear, you know, kayaks and skis and bicycles and that sort of thing. And, and one thing led to another and it turned into uh, wristwatch reviews, um, specifically dive watches is kind of where I um, kind of really kind of narrowed my niche focus. So when were you always a diver or did you start diving after you started reviewing the dive watch, which came first? <laughs> Well, it's, uh, it's an interesting story. Um, so around 2006, I, I bought kind of my first, I guess, high-end or higher-end uh, watch. Um, you know, I was always into watches. I wore watches in, in high school and, and through college. Um, but it was the mid-2000s that I kind of discovered the online web forums. I started buying watches of my own. And one of the first ones I bought was a dive watch. And I thought if I own a dive watch, I need to know how to dive. It was just this thing. I just felt like I was posing by wearing a big chunky dive watch on my wrist, but I didn't know how to use it. So I, I took up diving. I learned how to dive and quickly just got really hooked on it. And where was your first? One thing dive? led to another. My first dive, it was actually, you know, so if you go on, on holiday uh -huh. to the Caribbean or anywhere, in this case, it was uh, uh, Playa del Carmen in Mexico. And you can take what are called a discover scuba or a resort course where they'll teach you for half a day in the swimming pool, you know, how not to kill yourself uh, diving. And, uh, and then they take you out in the afternoon and, and throw you off of a boat with your gear on and take you diving. And I was just absolutely taken with it. It was just uh, thrilling to be out there with, you know, you were only 30 feet deep, but, you know, barracudas and all sorts of critters, moray eels and fish swimming around. And I, I just, I kept on with it. And uh, since at the same time I was doing all of this gear writing and, and I moved into watches, it just made sense to start doing uh, dive watches because that's where my passion really was. I've asked many of the guests that have been on um, about what was their first watch. Do you remember your first watch? Because you had mentioned before you were always kind of into watches. Yeah, um, my first watch was uh, junior year or senior year in high school. I think it was the summer in between. Um, I was at a, like a a mall near our house and I saw this uh, Seiko dive watch. It was an automatic. Um, this was in the late eighties. And I, I remember it was about $85 um, new in the case there. And so I, I cut grass and painted houses and whatever I did all summer to raise that, that amount of money to go buy that watch. And, um, and that was kind of the first. And then from there, you know, it morphed into, um, I had a citizen Aqualand and I've had, you know, Sunto digital watches, et cetera, et cetera. And then, the, you know, Dozens, maybe hundreds of watches later, here I am. Funny that the first watch was a dive watch. I mean, just yeah, because that really yeah. was your your passion at the time. I have a question uh, later on in the interview to ask about that exact uh, that exact idea of um, of owning dive watches when you don't dive. But we'll get into yeah. that after. Sure. 
Um, so the New York Times has called you the ideal test driver of dive watches, which is a is a interesting uh, label. Uh, <laughs> is there a specific method or approach um, that you have in choosing and testing them? In terms of choice, you know, often it, it would be what what comes up that's new and interesting at the, the various, at least in the past, trade shows. You know, the Basel Worlds and SIHHs of the world that uh, I used to attend regularly, and um, you know, we're we're just constantly seeing new great dive watches. And so I would reach out to my PR contacts at the brands and say, Hey, I've got a, a dive trip coming up, but I'd love to take one of your watches and, and try it out underwater. Um, if you're okay with that. And, uh, you know, more often than not, brands are, are happy to send it and, you know, they'll make sure it's watertight before they send it and then, and then I'll take it. Um, but, uh, you know, for the most part, I'd say nine out of 10 times, they, none, none of them have, <laughs> have had any issues or leaked or anything like that. But, and uh, is there a methodology uh, or did you develop a methodology over time where you would do certain things to test the watch, so to speak? You know, um, what's interesting is that, uh, as, as people may know, most divers that dive regularly aren't using their watches like they were used back in the 50s and 60s. And so dive computers, digital dive computers, do most of the calculations for a diver nowadays in terms of tracking no decompression time and safety stops and things like that. Um, so really, to me, I, I always tell people that, that a dive watch in modern terms is very much more of a, a, a memento or a, a collector of memories. And so to me, it's just more important with you know how it feels on the wrist, how it goes on over a wetsuit sleeve, um, you know how easy the bezel is to turn, and how legible it is underwater. And, and most dive watches since the '50s and '60s kind of do all of that fairly similarly and fairly well. I mean, they're they're pretty simple creatures. Um, so then it's all about how they look and how they make you feel when you wear them. And so much of watches in general, as you know, um, and dive watches specifically, are so much about the feelings they evoke and, and the way you feel when you wear them. And a dive watch is just such an adventure timepiece. What we try to do, my wife and I, is, uh, you know, we have a pretty good formula after doing this a, a few hundred times is, is to just get the right photos of the watch to demonstrate what it looks like underwater in different settings. And I've done, you know, cold water dives in, in Lake Superior where it's, you know, 40 degrees Fahrenheit water temperature up to, you know, the mid eighties in Sri Lanka or the Galapagos or places like this, that, that it's warmer water. and um, so, you know, it's, it's all about the challenge of getting the right photos and, and um, you know, just, just checking it out. I was going, I was thinking about that when you were mentioning that you lived in Minneapolis. So uh, I had lived in Chicago for several years myself and, and knowing the Great Lakes are there. Ha have you, have you yeah. dived in the Great Lakes? I mean, have you been in Lake Michigan? I have. I, I've dived in um, three of the five Great Lakes. So Superior, Michigan and Huron. Okay. Um, I growing up in Milwaukee, I actually wasn't a diver while I lived there, but I've been back several times. And, you know, you mentioned Chicago and um, there's actually some pretty decent wreck diving off of Chicago. There's actually, uh, although it's a little too deep to, to dive um, for a scuba diver, there's actually a, a German U-boat that was sunk in, in Lake Michigan off of Chicago, which is interesting. And a number of uh, U.S. Navy planes that, that crash landed there while they were doing training out of the naval base north of Chicago. Um, but the Great Lakes offer some great uh, great diving, great wreck diving. The water is very cold, um, so it preserves, and it's fresh water, of course, so mm -hmm. it preserves the wrecks very well, and so it makes for great, um, great wreck diving, and and some really dramatic photography as well. And I've done a number of watch reviews in the Great Lakes. If you can, if you can tolerate the cold, it's a it's a great place to dive. No, I would be more in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, but that's just me. I don't like the. Cult. I understand. Yeah, yeah. So, um, <laughs> you you've done these amazing dives. What what have, what, have, what would you say has been the most challenging aspect of test wa of testing watches? Uh, is there uh, any specific uh, challenge to that? I think uh, honestly, it's probably getting the photos. Um, the watches themselves take care of themselves. Um, you know, rarely have an issue with those. Um, it's more about getting photos. You know, when you talk about watch photography, these are, you know, small, very shiny objects. And uh, it's hard enough to shoot on a tabletop without getting reflection or um, get things in focus, get the hand position correct that you want for the photo. Well, then you try to do that underwater where, you know, my wife is the person behind the camera. Um, and we're talking about your, your 
you're layering different levels of complexity. You have underwater camera gear, which is expensive and very fragile to a certain degree, but also you have to be very concerned about those O-rings that nothing's leaking. Mm. Um, you know, we've done dives where you'll descend and suddenly you realize that <clears throat> memory card isn't in the camera, you know, nothing you can do about it. You're carrying around this empty, basically dead weight for the rest of the dive because you can't use it. Okay. So stop right. Stop right there. Who takes the yeah. blame on that one? Is your wife to blame <laughs> or is Jason to blame? I will, I will take the blame on that. I, I call myself the camera tech. She, you know, she gets in the water, I hand her the camera and then I have to go and you know hold my wrist up and kind of pose for the, the photo, come up with interesting places to pose. But, you know, just going back to what I was saying, like it's not only do you have this gear that you have to take care of and, and make sure it's working properly, but then, you know, taking a photo through water where you don't always have crystal clear visibility and you might have a current and you have to deal with all of this heavy equipment and hover and maintain good buoyancy underwater uh, is, is a real challenge. I mean, some places more than others. We spend a lot of time in, in the Caribbean, which is pretty friendly. It's warm. You don't have to wear too much exposure protection because it's not that cold and um, the water is generally you know, clear enough that you can take a good photo from 10 feet away. So I'm interested in your wife, Jashani. Am I saying her name correctly? Jashani, right? It's a hard, hard G, hard G. Hard so good. Gishani. Yeah. Gishani. Yeah. So Gishani, um, yeah. Yeah. She, uh, she, is she a photographer? Was she always a photographer? How did you, how did you rope her into this or did she rope you into it? <laughs> I did rope her into it. Okay. Um, you know, when I started writing freelance, I was doing these outdoor gear reviews, like back packs and hiking boots and things and you know i'd write these great reviews but for a real world review you need a photo of said product in mm -hmm. situ you know doing something with it and so she started taking these photos of me testing and wearing this stuff on hikes and you know, paddling a kayak in the lake down the street from our house and things and um when we started diving uh the first dive review i did interestingly enough this is actually quite funny we did it at a there's a, a former undersea habitat in the Florida Keys that has been it's been converted to an underwater hotel. It's called Jules Undersea Lodge, and it's run by a former aquanaut who bought this facility and, and maintains it nowadays. And it's about 25 feet underwater in a lagoon. And we were fairly new to diving at that point. We dove to this underwater hotel for a few hours, they let us go for a few hours. And we went inside and you take off your gear and it's dry. So you're inside this hotel um, with a big porthole window. And um, I suited up again in my gear and swam outside and was outside of that porthole. And Gashani was inside with a camera without an underwater housing, of course, which was brought down inside of one of these watertight Pelican cases so it wouldn't get wet. And so she was snapping photos of me, you know, swimming outside of the porthole with holding my watch up. And that was our first underwater dive watch review. Um, oh, cool. But then, you know, things evolved and we had to get an underwater housing, which is expensive and very specific to a camera. One thing led to another. And then as, as I kind of narrowed my focus, it became almost exclusively dive watches. So then it becomes a, you know, legitimate business expense to buy, you know, new underwater housings and new cameras to suit them. Do we remember what that first watch was that you were wearing? It was uh, it was a Doxa, so a Doxa, okay. you know, Swiss brand. They make uh, pretty legendary dive watches, and um, yeah, so I took that in the in the lagoon there in, in the Florida Keys. I've heard about this hotel. It must be really interesting. I mean, I've actually seen some pictures of it. Um, yeah. So you it dive, is cool because you, you dive down you, to the you, hotel and then you you, yeah. you get into a lock, I guess, and then you're in then you're in the hotel, right? I get. Yeah. So the way these work is, you know, it's like about the size of a school bus. They always say, uh -huh. um, and it's there's an open hole at the bottom of it that because they're filling this thing with pressurized air, that's the same pressure as the water outside of the hotel. It keeps water from flooding in through the bottom. Got it. And so when you swim in, you swim in underneath and come up through what's called a moon pool where the water is just right even with the surface of the inside. So you climb out inside of this. It, it's very surreal. It's a really interesting experience. And because it's pressurized air in there, your ears are always popping while you're inside. So it's not the most comfortable place. I wouldn't, I'm not sure I'd enjoy spending a few nights in there. Right. <laughs> You'd be ready to go on land uh, after a 24 hour I think so. Out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
So switching gears a little bit, let's talk a little bit about the 50s, because I, I believe the 50s were really um, the moment where uh, what we know dive watches to be today evolved from. So the, the kind of the birth of dive watches. Um, Boulevard was certainly a pioneer uh, on this front alongside uh, other early pioneers such as Rolex, Ben Russ, Blancpain, certainly in Hamilton. T tell us what you know about this period. It's, it's, it's a very interesting period. I think uh, a lot of the Boulevard collectors um, will we'll have an eye to this uh, decade. Yeah, um, the, the 50s were and 60s were the most interesting, probably 20 years of, of dive watches to me. And, and I think diving in general, because, you know, diving kind of before World War, World War, before World War II, diving was done with a heavy, you know, copper helmet. Um, with an air hose coming down to, to feed you air and you'd walk around on the bottom. These guys would wear lead boots and walk around. Well, when Cousteau and his partner Gagnon uh, invented the, the scuba cylinder, the Aqualung, in 1943, um, by the time the war ended and it started catching on a little bit more, now you could free swim. You know, you could swim around untethered to the surface and explore. And, and it quickly caught on in the 50s with recreational divers as well as the military. And the, the kind of the principles of diving are such that if you stay too deep for too long, the compressed air that you're breathing, the nitrogen from that gets forced into your tissues and you can get what's called the bends or decompression sickness. So these divers needed a way to time their dives. Um, and the simplest way to do that was with a rotating bezel, which was not really seen until the early 50s when a few brands uh, in 53, you know, namely uh, Zodiac, Rolex, Blancpain came up with this rotating bezel idea for, for timing things on a, on a dive watch. And then as time went on, you know, militaries started needing dive watches and started requesting those from the, the big brands to produce these specific for their, you know, their military applications. And then at the same time, you have recreational divers that are needing watches to, um, you know, to use to time their dives on, on the reefs in Cozumel or, or wherever they're going. And, you know, I know some of the earliest dive watches that are even used during World War II were these canteen watches where, you know, you'd have yep. a, a seal that would screw down over the crown of the watch to seal it. Well, once uh, a sealing crown, you know, an actual screw down crown came along and screw on case packs and things, watches just got better and better. Um, and, and, and then by, you know, the late 50s, we're seeing watches that are largely look the same as some of the watches we're seeing today, albeit a little bit smaller. But that form factor was kind of locked into place by the 50s with a very legible dial and a rotating timing puzzle. Yeah, the A11s, you know, which uh, Bulova and some of the other brands that, that were just mentioned before, they, they were taking these A11s and, and kind of making them, you know, watertight. Um, yeah. And possible kind of the precursor to what, what then would become you know legit you know dive watch um we, yeah. we gave a little sneak peek i believe on the new bull of a mill ship uh submersible that is actually yeah. um a, a prototype that we made for the navy and and we actually never commercially made the watch um before this coming year we'll, we'll be launching that uh in this summer um, can you tell us uh, what you know about the watch in reference to some of the early dive watches? Where does that bull of a mill ship submersible kind of fit into that? Yeah. So, you know, as I mentioned in the fifties, you start seeing this uptick in, in dive watch uh, creation by different brands. And of course the militaries need these watches for their, their Navy divers and, and the U S Navy approached Bulova, which was a, you know, obviously a big supplier to the U S military for, for many, many years. Um, and ask them, can you can you create a some kind of an underwater timepiece that, that we can use? And, the, and then I think it was in '57 or '58 they came up with this mill ships piece, a prototype, and of which they produced very few. You'd know better than me, but I think it was in the single digits uh, um, that were given to the Navy for testing. And you know, you asked me about how to test a, a dive watch, um, and and for me, you know, going maybe 100 120 feet deep and taking some nice photos of it is very different from the way the Navy would be testing watches back then. I mean, they were testing things to 400 feet deep. They were dragging them through mm. muddy river bottoms. And, um, you know, um, I was reading this report that I, I found, um, the, the U.S. Navy test report for that bull of a watch. And, you know, they're talking about, I remember one of the comments was quite humorous. It said, 
one of the, the, the criticisms of this watch was that it was a little too heavy. <laughs> you know, if we talk about dive watches nowadays, I mean, they'd be appalled at what, what everybody's wearing around nowadays, big, heavy watches. And they said, this might not, this might not be a good watch to wear casually. You know, it's more of a, a heavy working watch, um, you know, testing it to, to 392 feet or something like this. Um, and so they made a few of these watches and this is around the same time that you know, the space program starts to take off. And my understanding is that that Bulova sort of abandoned this dive watch concept um, after making these few prototypes to kind of focus its efforts on timing devices for the US space program, which was seemingly, and, and to many contractors of that age, um, a more lucrative and, and kind of bigger picture uh, thing to get into than than diving, which is, which is kind of a shame, but what we're left with is this, incredibly rare watch of which just a handful were made that, you know, uh, any collector that owns one of these is sitting on uh, quite, quite a, an expensive and, and rare piece. And, um, you know, one of the, the specifications of this watch was that it has a, a moisture indicator on the dial. Aside from the timing ring and the, and the big luminous uh, dial and hands, um, they wanted a way that you could, that would visually show at a glance if any water had intruded into the case and gotten the watch wet. And so it was this sort of stripe, bicolor stripe that was painted on the dial that would change color if any moisture got in the watch. And uh, so that's kind of the telltale uh, aspect of this watch. And I think what you see with that watch, with this, this bull of a mill ships is that it's kind of a, an archetype for all dive watches that follow, you know, we have, um, a few years later, the Navy also uh, did a similar study where they brought in a number of other brands. One that they chose ultimately was a Blanc Pond 50 Fathoms that everybody kind of knows about. Well, the, the Bulova from the late 50s looks almost identical. It looks, you know, it's almost like this was this was the blueprint. This was this is what we think of when you think if you looked well, up dive watch in the dictionary. That's what you see. It it was, it was it was the spec, so it was literally the specifications that the Navy had given. So just just a, a little of the back uh, backstory to uh, what you were mentioning, uh, and I I only I know this through a, a collector friend of our brand who has probably been uh, the foremost uh, seeker of of the of this particular bull of a mill ship watch. I think wow. he has owned. I think he has owned, if I remember correctly, at least four out of what he wow. thinks were 11 of the prototypes wow. ever made. Uh, he, wow. had, he had a new old stock uh, piece up until, I believe, a couple of months ago. I think he may have sold it now. Um, Incredible. But he gets in and out of them. But the backstory was, uh, was really impressive because uh, it, Omar Bradley, who was the last five-star general of the United States military, um, became the chairman of the company of Bolivo. So- he was already at Bulova during the late '50s um, when he had joined. He had joined the company. Uh, Bulova had also um, a very deep uh, ties to the U.S. military. We had a military division that had nothing to do with making watches. Uh, we made all different types of equipment for the U.S. military. So Omar Bradley becoming chairman of of the company was not that strange um, for for that to happen. And so I guess because he knew the U.S. Navy and he knew the inner workings of how the military works. Um, they were putting they were putting our engineers through through their paces, as you mentioned. Um, you read some of the reports of what the Navy was doing to test the watches, and I think at some point he, he said to the folks, you know, uh, on the engineering side, he's like, guys, how many watches <laughs> do you think the Navy is going to buy from you? You know, you'll be lucky yeah. if they buy a thousand watches. And I think yeah. where he felt the pressure was that at the same time the company was in the midst of getting ready to launch. Uh, what would become a revolutionary uh, moment in timekeeping, which would be the Accutron first oh, electric sure. watch ever made in 1960. So sure. he, kind of, he kind of said to them, you're working on bigger things. Let this mm. go because, you know, it, it's, it's just yeah. going to drag on and, and we need to finish this other project because uh, in October of 1960, we would launch the world's first um, manufacturable electronic watch. Um, wow. Yeah. Would be the tuning fork movement um, that would then later go on to have a, an amazing uh, 20 year, you know, 20 year run uh, as the really the precursor to quartz. Um, but all of that said, um, when when Bulova, you know, kind of stepped away from the project, 
that that's really how Blanc Pan, you know, comes in and sure, they yeah. end up kind of picking up where we had left off to eventually finish. And as we know, a beautiful watch that they created uh, yeah. known as 50 Fathoms today. Um, but uh, a, a really, a really fun back, back behind the scenes story. Um, Cause if it hadn't been for Accutron, Bova probably does end up finishing and making that watch, you know, for the U S Navy. Um, yeah. 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 And I'm glad you guys are uh, bringing out this, uh, this sort of re-release of that. I mean, it's a watch that's, kind of been laying dormant and unknown to so many for yeah i thought i'd wear it 60 60 plus years oh look at that yeah i don't know there it is yeah but um it's just a prototype but um we'll i'm sure we'll we'll show it and um it's really exciting i I think the coolest part of the watch is and i don't i don't know if you i don't know if the other watches had this feature but you press down to turn the bezel so as opposed to, oh, sure. you know, a ratcheted bezel was later invented so that, you know, you wouldn't lose whatever time you had set it to. And you would know that theoretically how much air you had left in your tank. Um, mm-hmm. they, these guys devised a system where you press down on the bezel, turn, and then let up. So it was oh, a sure. spring, spring-loaded bezel. I had never really seen that before. Um, wow. But wow. A, an interesting feature. So we were uh, yeah. able to be able to recreate that. Um, when we when we uh, finally uh, ship, you know, the final versions, we'll have that feature, which uh, was really cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so Jason, uh, there were a few other watches that Bulova made, uh, and I know that you've had the opportunity to actually some of them you've tested um, already. But talk to us about um, the dive watches. Let's say from the surfboard uh, oceanographer to the AKA Devil Devil Diver. I think actually you're you're wearing one um, today. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, as we as we've just discussed, so it's interesting that uh, you know if you kind of go through the history of dive watches and Bulova's dive watches, uh, we're talking about this Millships piece that was in '58. They move away from that to focus on the Accutron, as you mentioned. And then in the early '60s, we see um, a, a fairly different dive watch um, in what you know nowadays everybody refers to affectionately as the Devil Diver because of its 666 foot depth rating. Um, in the early 60s with uh, a twin crown in a compressor case. Stay on that point for one second, because people may not realize the normal standard. And I guess, you know, Bolova being an American company, you know, they always uh, they always looked at things differently being based in the United States as opposed to in in Switzerland or France. So talk about how normally, you know, depth would be measured for a watch. Yeah, I mean, typically, uh, you know, it, it's it's uh, listed on the dial or, or you know categorized or whatever in meters. Um, so the metric system and, and the earliest ones were 100 meters. Uh, Zodiac's first was 200 meters, which was you know very uh, very deep in those days in '53. But um, if you convert 200 meters to feet, you, it's roughly 660 feet and. Uh, you know, I guess maybe you know from some archive documents or something, but this little tweak that Bulova did was to rate it at 666 feet, which is a very symmetrical, nice looking depth rating on a dial, but it's also just a little bit deeper than than what the other brands at the time were doing. Um, yeah. And I also, think the- Also because, sorry, but also because in the United States, we didn't use the metric system. So right. I, again, I, I always like, I think about the manage, manager's from that era, thinking about in a very American centric way, as opposed to yeah. Europeans or, or Swiss, who of course think as, as they think in their country, we were thinking feet because we didn't, we didn't have metrics. I mean, there were no, yeah. no metric system here. So I, I think right. in order for people to understand that, you know, and, and then somehow it just works out that it's 666 feet, you know? Yeah. Feet. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, even as a, as a diver, as an American diver, I still think in feet, um, and, you know, feet, feet is actually a, a, a smaller, uh, you know, unit of measure than a meter. A meter is, you know, three, 3.3 feet or something like that. And so um, it's easier to think in terms of feet. You know, you go down two feet, it's not quite a meter. So um, I, I still think feet is a, be- a better indication of how deep you are diving. Um, but, you know, going back to these, these devil divers in the early 60s, we started to see watches that Bulova was making for recreational scuba diving, for not military divers, but for, I mean, the sport, if you can imagine, I can't even relate it to a specific activity or sport in modern times, but 
scuba diving was just exploding in the 60s. I mean, it was it was such an exciting sport. You know, the 50s was early days. That was military stuff. They were still ironing out some of the the details and, and some of the, the kinks in the in the equipment. But by the by the 60s, you saw people, you know, fairly adventurous people. I mean, this was an extreme sport back then. You know, this was like base jumping or something like that. You know, you're throwing on air tanks on your back and going, you know, even 50 feet underwater was death-defying back then. Um, and I think we don't realize that because it's just so easy nowadays. Everybody can kind of learn how to dive in a day. Um, so, you know, Bolivo kind of rose to that challenge. And because it was such a popular brand, you know, the need to have a recreational scuba divers watch um, was just tremendous. And they responded with this, uh, this series of devil diver watches. And, you know, the early ones were, you know, I mentioned the, the twin crown kind of super compressor style case. Then we saw, you know, the steel bezel version. These were a little bit more conservative, sedate looking, but boy, by the, the late 60s, early 70s, we move into these really colorful dial bezel, crazy, you know, domed crystals and bulbous cases with these amazing, um, you know, like this one with, with these amazing three-dimensional luminescent markers on the dial. Um, you know, th these watches were just exciting. They kind of reflected the excitement of the sport. So that's a good segue to your earlier comments when we started the interview about style uh, playing a role with dive watches. So as the colors were coming and the unique uh, dial settings, you know, uh, with different types of markers and what have you. So today we, I think all, all watch brands, you know, are selling a diver of some, you know, in quotations uh, of some sort. Uh, but we know all of all the folks that we're selling dive watches to are not diving. Um, so talk to me about the influence of dive watches on, on fashion and, and really time timekeeping, I guess, in general? I think, you know, like so many things, like a pair of work boots or a Carhartt jacket or whatever. I mean, we, we see uh, a nostalgia or, um, you know, people like things that are um, reflective and adventurous or a kind of a more rugged lifestyle. And I think even back in the day, back in the 60s and 70s, because diving was seen as this adventurous sport to wear one outside the water to the office or the grocery store or whatever, you know, you, you felt more adventurous maybe than you were, or maybe it, maybe it made you more, feel more adventurous, do more adventurous things. I speaking personally, I mean, that was me with that first dive watch that I bought in high school. Um, I remember wearing that watch. I felt like James Bond. I felt like I could do different things because I had this kind of burly, very capable, big watch on my wrist. And I think we see that nowadays. And I think a watch that is over engineered to take what whatever you can throw at it, you know, that it can go 666 feet underwater um, allows you to wear it doing anything, whether it's you know, rock climbing, sailing, um, you know, bagging a peak, you know, climbing in Colorado or, or diving. Uh, it, it reflects that. And I think I've always been attracted to dive watches because it's the one, it's the one piece of equipment you don't have to take off. You know, I mean, literally everything else, um, and without getting too personal and intimate here, you don't have to take anything, you know, everything else you take off, right? Except your watch. I mean, you, you wear this thing, um, the right watch, you know, if it looks okay and fits well and whatever, you can do anything with it. And it collects all of those life memories so that when you're back at the office on Monday, you could look down at your wrist and say, oh, this watch on my wrist I was wearing uh, Saturday when I was diving a shipwreck in Lake Superior. You know, I, I just love that about them. So not only are you like the, the super expert diver uh, and watch connoisseur, but you're also a writer. And so you recently wrote and published the novel called Depth Charge. Can you tell us what was the inspiration for the book? Uh, why did you do the book? Uh, what, what, what led you to that path? Yeah, thanks for asking about it. Um, I, you know, this was late 2019 and uh, I was kind of between things. And, and my wife and I were actually vacationing at a place called Golden Eye, which is Ian Fleming's old estate in Jamaica, Jamaica so where yeah. he, he wrote all of his James Bond novels there. And we were sitting by the lagoon, you know, on our lawn, you know, lounge chairs between snorkeling outings. And I just suddenly got in my head that I, I've always wanted to write a thriller, a thriller novel. You know, I was an English lit major in college and um, that was always focused on really kind of high-minded literature and, you know, reading for metaphor and author intention and things like that. 
but I really like thrillers. I like the Clive Cussler novels. I like, you know, Ian Fleming and um, Alistair MacLean and authors like that. And just started piecing together some plot ideas and, and decided to embark on this novel. And then lo and behold, we had a, a crazy 2020, which I spent a lot of time not traveling, not diving much, sitting at home. And it was a great opportunity to just plow through and get this 260 page novel done. I mean, it's something I've dreamed about doing for 10 years. And uh, as you might expect, a lot of it takes place underwater. It's very much a sort of an adventure thriller that takes place uh, off of the east coast of Sri Lanka, which is where my wife is from, um, and uh, involves uh, you know, some intrigue and, and psychopathic bad guys and uh, lots of underwater uh, uh, adventure. So, um, you know, yeah, it's been kind of a crazy ride getting, getting it all packaged up, getting it out on Amazon and, and signed copies and all of that. So it's, it's been a, a new adventure for me. I was going to ask you where people can find the book. It's on Amazon? It's on Amazon now. Uh, Kindle just opened up today. And then if people want signed copies, it's at uh, depthchargenovel.com, which is my own site where I've you know, got a dining room full of copies myself and I'm signing and shipping off. So, yeah. And how's, how's the book selling so far? It's just early days. You're, you're encouraged? It's great. I, so good. I had an initial run of, uh, of 500 that I signed and sold right away. And I just ordered another 500. And, um, and then on Amazon, uh, that just opened up uh, this week and that's uh, starting to take off as well. So, you know, fingers crossed it's going well. And I think more importantly to me, I'm, I'm getting good feedback from people that have already read it, that they like it. To me, that's, that's what's rewarding even more than the sales of it. Yeah. And this yeah. is the first book. This is your first book, right? It's my first book. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've done chapters. I did the bull of a chapter uh, yeah. for you guys. I've, I've done a few other um, kind of chapters for books for Hodinkee and some other places, but yeah, my first, first work of fiction, which was quite, quite different. So how many, how many different places have you, have you been to, to dive? I mean, how many, do you keep track of that or? I have dived um, many, many places. I, I don't keep track, but uh, just a few of the places I, I was in, we did a, a trip, very short trip to a, a pretty exotic place called Mauritius, which is in the middle of the Indian ocean. It's kind of between Africa and kind of the Indian subcontinent. That was an interesting trip. Uh, I dove in perhaps the most interesting place was in a place called Milford Sound, which is in New Zealand, the South Island of New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And it's a kind of a fjord where the sea comes in and kind of there's mountains on all sides, and very cold water. Um, and then all over the Caribbean, um, we go to Bonaire. We try to get down there every year, but uh, uh, Mexico and uh, yeah, Great Lakes are right in my backyard, so they're kind of the the home port here. But other than that, yeah, it's been it's been all Japan, the Galapagos. Yeah, Jason, it's been it's been really great to speak to you and get to know you a little bit. Is there any last words uh, that you have for us uh, today? I'm just you know, thanks a lot for having me on and and for you know chatting about my book and talking about Bulova and kind of my favorite topic, which is diving and dive watches. And I hope that um, anybody out there that uh, has reservations about diving or has always been interested about doing it, you know, take your watch and, and go dive with it. I think uh, it was an inspiration for me and it, you know, having a watch and then learning to dive uh, changed my life, led to, led to a whole different career for me. So who knows what it can do for you? Well, Jason, thank you very much. Jason Heaton, everyone, uh, please check out his new book, Depth, Depth Charge, Depth Charge, say that right. Um, it's available on Amazon. It's available on, what's the website again? depthchargenovel.com. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Awesome. Thanks.